Hello, welcome to Weather God's Wisdom, where we talk about the tropics, and uh, yeah, that's it for now. We're going to talk about the pattern change tonight, too, that's happening over the United States, but for now we're going to talk about these couple areas. If you look at the five-day graphical outlook, you have a couple of disturbances in here. Um, one off Florida, one off the southeast coast, and one well in the middle of nowhere in the central Atlantic, and this one has the highest chance of development. If you can look at the uh, water, that's no wrong, water vapor loop. Um, <laughs> you have the system that is probably going to develop into a subtropical or tropical storm that is going to try to kind of drift west before it gets absorbed by a trough that's centered over the United States right now. And then you have these two systems that have a 10 and 30% chance, respectively, 10 and 30. Um, are probably going to end up joining together and becoming a uh, kind of nor'easter like system. That or a very large subtropical system that has, um, you know, maybe maybe gets named. Um, not entirely sure. Um, I would guess that this probably just becomes a mess for the Northeast, and you know, not really a whole lot of um, like impacts that are out of the normal for this time of year. You typically have troughs that come in here. I mean, a little later than, or earlier than normal for right now, because it's only October, but um, typically for later part, the later part of this month, you tend to get nor'easters in this area, and so you'll have, like, you know, 50 mile an hour winds over here, and it'll be snowy, but this is not going to be snowy, this is all going to be wet and kind of cold, um, so... Just something to keep an eye out. Uh, as for impacts, regardless, you're probably going to get a lot of rain in this area. And um, this is not like you're out of the ordinary nor'easter. This is not Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this is just, you know, a normal nor'easter. Kind of uh, a stronger type of nor'easter, I guess. It's not, um, you know, insane, though. So that's what I'm trying to stress here. But anyway, yeah, that's it for the Atlantic. Not a, really, not a whole lot to talk about. With the Atlantic, I mean, this thing got a couple waves still trying to come off the coast, even though it's late in the season. Got a wave right here, a wave right here. And then a possibility for a Central American gyre event in about, you know, a week's time. But we're kind of um, not so sure about that because only one model has been hinting at it, and that's the GFS. And GFS is the only model that goes out further than seven days or ten days. And so that's kind of why we're little more timid about it. European model has something coming off of the African coast after seven days. And, you know, we tend to watch these things with kind of a half caution because the synoptics have not formed yet for that to happen. But once it gets closer, then obviously we must watch it because these models tend to be a little more reliable when they're, when it's less than seven days or, you know, less than five days out and you can kind of see like what's happening and, you know, you can get a general idea for it. But anyway, that's all for the Atlantic. Um, as for uh, the Amer America, United States, um, well, the high has been vanquished. And I know today across Texas, we had pretty cool temperatures, and it felt really good uh, outside. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of um, people were pretty happy about that today. And uh, the trough is now moving across the southeast, and you're starting to finally get, you know, cooler temperatures and everything. And this is kind of setting up the pattern for the fall. We're going to have a lot of troughs come in. You can see that in the uh, European model. If you go back to the kind of zero hours, you can see the trough moves in, and then another one moves in. This one's going to be very, you know, kind of stronger in here. Um, and, yeah, you kind of have this cycle of troughs that comes through. And so, this is obviously 216 hours out, so, you know, timing and positioning will change, but through 90, through, through 120 hours, you know, you probably have another trough that comes in here and does uh, give us some more energy in here, and you can actually see this trough on the top right of your screen, and it should be uh, pretty interesting. Um, I hope we get some rain out of this, because we didn't get rain out of this trough uh, here in Central Texas, at least. Um... But yeah, this is uh, really good news for all the people that have been suffering from record-breaking heat. We had 104 days in a row. I think it was five, maybe five days in a row in Meridian, Mississippi. I don't know why I was circling, out, circling Alabama. I think it's a rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so pattern change has happened. And this is really good. And um, I'm 
think the uh, Southeast is really celebrating this happening. But anyway, that's all for kind of the Western Hemisphere. Now onto the Eastern Hemisphere, where we talk about more serious stuff. Um, we've got Super Typhoon Hagibus, which has, over the past couple of days, I really wanted to do a video yesterday, but I had a lot of stuff happen. But um, regardless, Hagibus went under this explosive intensification and just really bombed out and you can see that it's kind of degraded on satellite imagery if you get a closer look at it you can see that the eye is not as clear you can kind of see a concentric eye wall forming you have the inner eye wall right here and you can see this little break in the clouds and then a larger eye wall in here and you can actually see this also in microwave imagery you have this larger outer ring that is choking out this very very small inner ring now this storm had a very very small eye and so it's easy for this to happen. But once this happens, the storm should, or completes, this storm should re-intensify and probably could get back up to Category 5 status. Um, it is exiting the uh, warm pool that it was in when it was over here. And as it moves northward, um, and we'll look at the divergence, it's going to move northward and you know, kind of work its way around this uh, ridge, this mid-level ridge that you can see under the outflow and outer bands that are uh, from the system. This is a giant system too. This is a very powerful and you know, a very large system. And it's unfortunate that this has to eventually move north towards Japan. And while it is moving towards Japan, it will be weakening. And that is good news. Um, we don't know how weak this is going to get exactly because it still could re-intensify even as it is undergoing the eyewall replacement cycle. Well, after after it goes under the eyewall replacement cycle, I should say. Um, but, you know, as this moves out of the kind of very warm area of mid-level or very moist area of uh, mid-level dry air, this should eventually begin to weaken. There is a little bit of subsidence out ahead of it. Um, but right now it's in a very deep environment of divergence and you can see right in here upper level divergence is pretty high right in here and this is good for the system to ventilate while it does undergo the eyewall replacement cycle and that's why the system is very large because you kind of see this very large area that is kind of superimposed over where the system is and as this moves to the north it should get a lot larger and actually if we pull up the uh, hurricane models HWRF uh, parent. You can see just how large this gets when it is impacting uh, Japan and you notice that it is weaker on the H wharf. This is probably seriously underdone because it is at 944 millibars and the only time that we've had a 944 millibar system that is under you know 100 miles and 120 miles an hour has been a uh, Hurricane Sandy and that was probably double the size of this. So <laughs> Um, but it is supposed to be very large, and this is going to affect a very large area all the way from Fukuoka to Tokyo, and maybe even further south. Um, but as this kind of rolls through here, you can see that the, the storm is still very deep and very intense, and it will be very large, but I know that Japan um, has pretty excellent uh, disaster management program, so I'm not terribly worried, but this is going to be a very powerful system when it reaches Japan, so there will be damage, and there will be, you know, um, it'll be bad, and this is not a joke, and if you are in Japan, you should take this very seriously, because this is probably going to be one of the strongest typhoons to ever hit the island, and I would really stress to you that, you know, this is, this is the big one for the year. And what happens after this could actually affect, um, if you go back to the European model, um, could actually affect, you know, the ridging pattern and situation. If we have a Central American gyre event, this could uh, supercharge a ridge that's over the area and, you know, kind of push any system like westward or, you know, like, push it westward and then kind of around the ridge here 
and you know the Gulf Coast would be affected. But this is obviously very far away, and right now we're kind of worried more about what this does to Japan because this still will be very powerful and very large. It's still forecast to be a Category Two si si typhoon when it's up here, and so this is this is dangerous, and you should prepare accordingly. I know Japan kind of stresses that, so is a good thing that Japan is always like super ready for this. But as always, refer to the JTWC if you're in Japan for the latest on Hagibis. And um, if you're in the continental United States, refer to the National Weather Service and National Hurricane Center for the latest on these systems that are out here in the Atlantic right now. And... All credit goes to Levi Cowan at TropicalTidbits.com and the uh, NASA for providing the satellite imagery um, and National Hurricane Center for and National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration for all this imagery and all the credit goes here to the Colorado State um, slider uh, stuff. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it's called, but um, and as always. Uh, University of Wisconsin, credit them for the microwave imagery and the divergence imagery. And that is all. I'm going to get back to studying eventually. And yeah, have a good evening. <laughs>